Thanks, Joe, for that introduction. It's always an honor and a treat to be here at, at Quarry Farm um, and to be invited to, to give a talk in this series. Quarry Farm is a very special place, as I'm sure everyone here knows. And I want to thank Joe, Matt Siebold, and uh, Steve Webb for their remarkable stewardship of this national treasure and for their energetic and creative uh, leadership for the Center for Mark Twain Studies. While we're at it, we should recognize the Langdon, family, Langdon family's generous vision in dedicating this site to the support of Mark Twain's legacy and of Susan and Theodore Crane, uh, who welcomed the Clemens family uh, to Quarry Farm for decades. Uh, if not for their invitation, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I also want to thank all of you for coming. Um, it's always gratifying to have uh, an attentive and engaged audience. A couple of the terms uh, in the title of my talk, I should probably, there we go. A couple of the terms in the title of my talk might come as a bit of a surprise to you. First, poetry. Mark Twain was not known as a poet. He was a writer of wry prose. In his inaugural editorial after taking the reins of the Buffalo Express, he promised his readers, quote, I shall not write poetry unless I conceive a spite against the subscribers. <laughs> and he admitted much later that anybody can write the first line of a pro poem, but it is a very difficult task to make the second line rhyme with the first. <laughs> However, these demurals aside, he did write a small handful of poems. With the exception of one, an ode that he wrote uh, memorializing his daughter Susie on the anniversary of her death. He wrote mostly mock poetry, parodies of bad poetry. Some of you who've read uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn may remember Emmeline Grangerford's Ode to Stephen Dowling Botts. She was sort of known for writing lugubrious poems about people who died prematurely. And then, of course, she died prematurely. Um, and in the first two examples of poems that I'm going to be talking about this evening, and there are four, so not too many, um, poetic failure is central to the humorous intent. Before we get to those examples, um, we should look at another surprising term in my title, and that is property. Why property, you might ask? Well, in more than a few of Twain's verses, his topic is property. It just so happens that I've spent the better part of 15 years researching and writing about the fact that Sam Clemens and Mark Twain held very uh, different attitudes toward the concept of property and the complications of ownership. Indeed, I probably would have ignored all these poems if it weren't for the fact that they're about the topic that I'm interested in, as most other scholars have sort of not paid much attention to these poems either. My objective in, in this work has been to discover and to show that Mark Twain had a complex, nuanced, and often skeptical perspective on the American ideal of ownership. Indeed, ideals of any kind made him wary. He noted that, quote, it's at our mother's knee that we acquire our noblest and truest and highest ideals, but there is seldom any money in them. Of course, historically, Americans have embraced the ideal of property ownership because of its value as an asset, monetary and otherwise. Alexis de Tocqueville, after traveling through the United States in the 1830s, observed that most inhabitants of a democracy have property. And not only have they got property, but they live in the conditions in which men attach most value to property. The eminently quotable Abraham Lincoln asserted directly that property is the fruit of labor. Property is desirable. It is a positive good in the world. And the biography, biographer of John Hay, William Roscoe Thayer, took up the topic, claiming that you have property is proof of industry and foresight on your part or your father's. The property you own be it a tiny cottage or a palace, means so much more than the tangible object. With it are bound up whatever in history times has stood for civilization. 
So an attack on property becomes an attack on civilization. All of these emphasize the positive value of property to its owner, to the nation, and in the case of Thayer, capital P property to capital C civilization. On the other hand, we have a countervailing view in the satirical writings of Ambrose Bierce, who in his Devil's Dictionary defined property as any material thing having no particular value that may, that may be held by A against the cupidity of B. Whatever gratifies the passion for possession in one and disappoints it in all others. The object of man's brief rapacity and long indifference. For Bierce, property is not in and itself valuable. Instead, it inspires base passions of greed and a desire to punish anyone who may ignore or transgress what the property owners insist are their rights over all others. Notably, Sam Clemens and Mark Twain held disparate views on property. Sam Clemens believed in the desirability of property. He aggressively you know, sought to uh, you know, acquire property, and he developed ingenious means for protecting his property. Mark Twain, on the other hand, wrote critically about how property inspired what Beers calls cupidity and rapacity words that even in the 19th century were slightly formal synonyms for greed. Not for nothing did Mark Twain name the last third of the 19th century the Gilded Age, an era distinguished by the capitalist greed that Beers sneers at. In the novel of the same title, Twain satirized the inequities of property ownership and its collision with political patronage. In the Gilded Age and elsewhere, Twain suggests that property could burden its owner with obligations and misleading expectations of worth. These differences in Clemens and Twain's attitudes expose tensions in the ideal of American property ownership. Moreover, Mark Twain recognized that ownership rights were not always as clear cut as we imagine them to be, not because of any particular political ideology or economic system, but rather as a consequence of how ownership rights are established in language. He reminds us in following the equator that, quote, language is a treacherous thing, a most unsure vehicle, and it can seldom arrange descriptive words in such a way that they will not inflate the facts, unquote. This observation matches a point made by legal theorists of property who observed that the rights and responsibilities of ownership are asserted in what they refer to as property narratives. Like all narratives, those related, even in legal instruments, are prone to instability and misinterpretation, leaving ownership disputes to be resolved in judicial rulings that may often be equally imperfect. This inherent, in, this inherent fallibility of language is central to the first two poems that we'll look at this evening, which satirize the problematic complexity of poetic language to comment on the vexed relationship between property and language. Now, Mark Twain's first writing on, po on property came early in his career. The aptly titled Real Estate Versus Imaginary Possessions Poetically Considered was published in the Californian in October of 1865, about three weeks before his story, Jim Smiley and his Jumping Frog, gave the name Mark Twain wider recognition. In real estate, Twain jumps into the tangle of ownership and poetry with both feet. The piece opens with a poem titled My Kingdom by Paul Duar, which had appeared in the San Francisco Evening Bulletin shortly before Twain's piece. His reprinting of this poem is followed closely by his criticism of it. Addressing Dwar directly, Twain admits to having been fooled by the title, which led him to expect an account of some vast domain over which the poet rules. Instead, he was deeply disappointed by the poem's use of property as a metaphor for the heart of the poet's beloved. Matching the poet's inflated diction, Twain refers to Duar's ramifications, but admits that he doesn't know what that word means. 
and has chosen the five-syllable word merely as flattery before taking the poet to task. His primary complaint is that the poem's kingdom is a lot of fuss and frill with none of the value of real estate. What good is this metaphorical property, he asks. You can't sell it, you can't hire it out, you can't raise money on it. And he mocks what he refers to, uh, to, refers to as Dewar's cheap climax, the final revelation of his metaphor's tenor, one true woman's heart. And he condemns the application of capital letters to that breathless phrase. But he doesn't just critique the poet's effusions about his metaphorical kingdom. No, Twain attempts his own poem as a counterstatement, a parody of the theme and rhyme scheme of the original, which we can see in a comparison of the opening stanzas. And you'll note the underlined words on the right for Twain's poem, My Ranch, I've underlined the words that are diverge from the original. The parody continues throughout, usually just changing a word or two in a line. However, Twain comes up short, his poetic tank runs dry after managing to eke out only four stanzas in comparison to Duar's seven. Here's Twain's full composition to challenge Duar's. I have a ranch of quite unknown extent. It's turnips great, it's oats without compare. And all the ranches other men may rent are not like mine, so not a dern I care. Tis all my own, no turnstile, turnstile power may rise to keep me outward from its rich domain. It hath a fence that time itself defies, and all invaders must climb out again. Tis true sometimes with stones tis overcast, and troublous clods offend the sensitive sight. Yet from the furrows I these so quickly blast, their radiant seams do show more clear and bright. It hath a sow, my sow, whose love for grain no swearing subject will dispute. Her swill is mine, and all my slops her gain, and when she squeaks, my heart with love is mute. <laughs> and then he notes here that the machine let down, meaning he could not continue. In addition to the clear parodic intent that we saw in the comparison of the first stanzas and the fact that Twain's poetic machine gave out after four stanzas, the entire poem offers evidence of his satiric wit. My Ranch deflates Duar's lofty romantic metaphor of his beloved with a down-to-earth inventory of Twain's acreage, crops, and livestock, emphasizing the value of tangible assets and insisting on the superior, superior materiality of his property. Moreover, Twain emphasizes his ownership with the possessive pronoun in the title and its italicized form in the last stanza that the ranch's sow is my sow, but the pig's squeak inspires no emotional response in this matter-of-fact poet. Unlike Duar's inflated emotional trick of using capital letters to pump up his beloved. Twain's poem boasts capital assets, the kind you can raise money on. Further significance of the poetic mockery embedded in this neglected early sketch resides in Twain's conflating the importance of property and language. Along with his adoption of the term ramification, which he admits is for effect rather than meaning, his poem calls attention to his own deliberate diction. He highlights the colloquial word dern in the first stanza, which his footnote then explains is an imprecation favored out in the ranching districts used in the society of ladies. And he invents a neologism, expressionomy, to refer to the regional vernacular. This mashup of two words, expression and economy, is a tip-off that he is concerned with the double function of language as a medium of communication and a vehicle for conveying exchange value. The final stanza's assertion that his sow's love of grain can be attested by any swearing subject gestures to the kind of official declarations, sworn testimony, that are necessary to the validation of any ownership claim. My ranch then functions in two ways. 
First, it deflates the metaphorical excesses of love poems, and second, it offers a property narrative, poetically rendered, albeit poorly, that is the basis of our system of ownership as a more worthy kind of poetry. Now, this very early poem is just a warm up. The confusion of property and poetry and their differing forms of linguistic presentation comes to a head a few years later in a short and entirely overlooked sketch titled A Memory, published in the Galaxy magazine in August of 1870. The story's narrator begins by admitting that he and his father had a distant relationship, what he calls a sort of armed neutrality. Over time, the father exhibited increasing disappointment in the narrator, which grew into antagonism and eventually abuse. In contrast, the father heaped praise and admiration on his other son, the narrator's half-brother, Oren. The topic of poetry is announced at the outset when the narrator recalls that his father loved only one poem, an ode to Hiawatha, no doubt the very popular Longfellow epic, which the father would sometimes read aloud. On one such occasion, the topic of pro poetry, or excuse me, property merges with poetry. After concluding his reading, the father took from his pocket a warranty deed to quote, a handsome property obtained by his favored son from a Texan lady and gentleman in gratitude for having saved their lives by an act of brilliant heroism, unquote. The father, moved by the majesty of Longfellow's poem and the significance of Oren's property, declares, quote, if I had such a son as this poet, meaning Longfellow, here were a subject worthier than the traditions of these Indians. There is more poetry, more romance, more sublimity, more splendid imagery hidden away in that homely document, meaning the warranty deed, than could be found in all the traditions of all the savages that live, unquote. Now, perceiving this moment as an opportunity to win his father's approval, the narrator asks permission to try his hand at such a poetic composition. The father gives his consent, but with a warning. Mind curb folly. No poetry at the expense of truth. Keep strictly to the facts. The would-be poet rushes off to craft his verses. However, Despite knowing that he was to convey what he calls the romantic story of his half-brother's adventure and subsequent good fortune, he heeded only the letter of his father's remarks and ignored their spirit. In other words, his poem does not describe his half-brother's heroism, for which the land was deemed a reward, but instead deploys the language of the warranty deed itself verbatim, reformatted, reformatted into what he calls Hiawathan blank verse. Returning to his father, he proudly begins the recitation of his poem, which begins as follows. This indenture made the 10th day of November in the year of our Lord, 1,806 and 50, between Joanna S. E. Gray and Philip Gray, her husband of Salem City in the state of Texas of the first part, and O. B. Johnson of the town of Austin, ditto, party of the second part, and it continues from there. Now, the nub of Twain's joke at this point um, is in the narrator's cobbling of the property document's language into poetry, and it turns on his limited poetic talent on the one hand, and on the confusion between Oren's ostensible courageous deed and the legal document, the property deed. In fact, the word deed, meaning both action or either action or document, is more than a lexical coincidence because the ownership document is what linguists and property theorists alike refer to as uh, performative speech acts, a verbal declaration that when witnessed and legally registered details the property rights and responsibilities of the parties involved. By treating the language of property ownership as the substance of the poem, the sketch shares a tendency that we saw in Twain's first uh, attempt at writing verse in real estate poetically reconsidered. The poem, My Ranch, 
draws a distinction between the puffed up insufficiency of the figurative poetic language in Dewar's love poem and the tangibility in the vernacular language of material value of his ranch property. The story of a gallant deed plays on a similar tension by substituting the legal language of the property deed for the elevated diction of heroic verse. And by failing to produce the romance that his father attributes to Oren's act, the narrator's re uh, reciting of his poem prompts the disappointed father to unload on him with a barrage of missiles. Now, if this were all that the poem entailed, it would be an amusing joke if a somewhat thin one. However, there's additional irony embedded in the story of a gallant deed, which becomes clearer when we look more closely at the terms described in the contract. And they read as follows. That said party of the first part, foreign in consideration of the sum of $20,000 lawful money of the US of America, uh, to them in hand now paid by said party of the second part and blah, blah, blah. And this uh, land is now conveyed to the party of the second part and his heirs and assigns forever and ever. You get the idea. But what's missing here is any mention of a reward for an act of brilliant heroism one that saved the lives of the grateful couple. Instead, the deed poem's language simply describes a transaction, a plot of land sold for $20,000. And incidentally, in today's values, that would be equal to about $740,000. The lack of any mention of heroism and the description of the transaction lead me to infer that Oren's rescue of the couple was not the result of some act of courage. Instead, his life-saving act was simply the $20,000 purchase of the Texas couple's land. If so, then the couple's life-saving, life-threatening situation was their ownership of the land itself. But why would ownership of the land threaten the lives of Joanna and Philip Gray? Again, the poem contains a possible answer. The deed's poem's language describes the land as follows. A certain piece or parcel of land in the city of Dunkirk, county of Chautauqua, and likewise, furthermore, in York State. And then it goes on to describe d uh, directions and uh, distances, all linked to two streets, one Mulligan Street, the other Branningham Street. And then the poem breaks off here. That's when his father starts throwing things at him. <laughs> we can dispense with the seemingly precise measurements and the cardinal and sort of incomprehensible secondary intercardinal directions, and instead note that the boundaries are benchmarked to Mulligan and Brannigan streets. These specific benchmarks are problematic because maps of Dunkirk, New York, from this period show no streets by those names. And in fact, the town historian, Diane Andrasik, has confirmed that no such streets have ever existed in Dunkirk. Although Twain's use of fictitious street names in a humorous sketch may seem inconsequential. The D poem does specify an actual locale, city of Dunkirk, county of Chautauqua, York State. In fact, the town of Dun Dunkirk was familiar to Sam Clemens. It lay about 45 miles southwest of his home at the time in Buffalo. And he had traveled to Dunkirk by train in January of the same year for a lecture in Fredonia immediately to the south of Dunkirk. He could just as easily have included actual streets in the deed's description in keeping with the actual town of Dunkirk. However, by describing the parcel as bounded by non-existent streets, he introduces the implication that the Gray's land was also non-existent. And whoever had sold the land to them had perpetrated a fraud that put their economic lives at risk. Enter Oren, whose eagerness to purchase the Dunkirk land rescued the Greys from their misguided purchase. As a resident of Austin, Texas, Oren would not have been familiar with York State, or let alone Chautauqua County or the, town, the city of Dunkirk. But encouraged by his father's romantic notions about property ownership, he would have been keen to acquire land and insufficiently diligent in researching the status of the property. In other words, Oren was an easy mark. A 19th century version of the proverbial fool who buys Florida swampland sight unseen. 
So the likelihood that the Greys have passed their own misfortune on to Orin is, I suggest, the deep germ of the joke. A joke that highlights the fact that the desire to own property exposes one to the risk of being swindled, which is a very favorite topic of Mark Twain. Now, Twain's interest in the language and consequences of a property narrative connects to important experiences. As a miner, and more importantly, a mine owner, Sam Clemens obtained shares or state claims on mining properties that would have been described in documents much as the Dunkirk land is described. So we would have had familiarity with this kind of language. In 1870, around the time when he wrote this poem, Mark Twain began writing some of the preliminary materials that would become his autobiography. In those early forays of life writing, he recalls that his father, John Marshall Clemens, who had served as county clerk of Fentress County in uh, uh, Tennessee, quote, had acquired a monstrous tract of 75,000 acres, which he bought at one purchase for somewhere in the neighborhood of $400, intending to leave a valuable inheritance for his heirs. Twain describes this gesture as laying the heavy curse of prospective wealth upon our shoulders. And indeed, it was a heavy curse because the assumed wealth never materialized, but also because the family's belief in the Tennessee land rests on a distorted mythology that diverges rather strikingly from documented fact. How the family came to believe in the inflated size and value of the Tennessee land and how it ultimately disappointed them is a somewhat long and convoluted story. But the documents uh, behind the story reveal that the Clemens family real estate holdings were a fraction of what they had come to believe and worth even less. For example, the claim that John Clemens acquired the monster tract in one trans transaction just simply not true because the state of Tennessee did not issue grants of land greater than 5,000 acres. Over a period of 13 years, John Clemens did obtain as many as 20 land grants as well as making a few other purchase, purchases, but those grants averaged about 150 acres and a number of the parcels were jointly owned with other, proper, other parties. Even more problematic, the titles are either not clear or are entirely in error. For example, one particular grant of the maximum of 5,000 acres was registered in the Fentress County Records Office three different times as being uh, Clemens family property, and each time its size was multiplied to the point where it was described as 35,000 acres. And it's interesting that John Clemens was responsible for recording a lot of the information in the Fentress County records. <laughs> Thus, the Clemens property narrative, the documented one, as well as the family lore, reveals the kind of dodginess about which legal theorists warn us. The final disposition of the land was equally dispiriting. The family's stake in future prosperity was either lost to tax forfeiture or sold off piecemeal for much less than they imagined it would be worth. One final scheme to sell off remaining scattered acres in 1905 resulted in a lawsuit challenging the Clemens title to the land, which was not resolved until after Sam Clemens died and not in the family's favor. Thus, Orrin Johnson's acquisition of land whose existence is in question, the land, not Orrin Johnson, dovetails closely with what was known or suspected about the Clemens family land even in 1870. Now, no doubt you probably recognize that the duped half-brother's name, Orrin, is a near-dead ringer for Orion, Sam Clemens' older and ne'er-do-well brother, an association that is further bolstered by his surname, Orrin Johnson, making him like Orion, John's son. Twain often made Orion the target of jokes about financial miscalculation in the Gilded Age. For example, Twain lampooned Orion as the reluctant bargainer, Washington Hawkins, who repeatedly turns down many reasonable bids on the Hawkins family 75,000 acres of Tennessee land because the offers fall short of the inflated value that he believes the land is worth. This is a plot point drawn from life. 
because the Clemens land, whether to sell it or to hold it, as well as dispute, uh, disputes about its value, divided Sam and Orion Clemens. And that dispute lurks in the background of a memory. What's different in the story is that the underlying facts of Orrin Johnson's unfortunate purchase are obscured. The father's pride in his son's possession then endures, much like John Clemens, patriarch, land speculator, and family mythmaker. The father in the story finds much to admire in acquiring the land recorded in the deed. The possibility of its fraudulence never occurs to him. Consequently, he finds no aesthetic virtue in the narrator's recasting of the document's language into poetry. For him, the property narrative asserted in the warranty deed stands on its own, and only a poem that celebrated it in suitably heroic language could capture the romance of ownership. Instead, Twain undercuts the hollow ideals of the father in the story in a double-barreled parody. First, he mocks the aesthetic merits of poetic language in the narrator's botched performance. And second, by planting the idea that the Dunkirk land deal is a scam, the story of the gallant deed satirizes the faith that people place in the language of property. Now, up until this point, Twain's poetic forays have dealt with fictional property. His marriage to Olivia Langdon made his connection to real estate very material. As a wedding gift, the bride's father gave the couple a house on Millionaire's Row in Buffalo. And a few years later, they traded up by moving to Hartford and building the mansion that is a museum today. This ambitious real estate venture in Hartford began with the purchase of an odd-shaped lot of 3.2 acres in a fashionable neighborhood, home to a number of national and local luminaries. Within a few years, the Clemenses added other portions to the lot to more than double the size of the parcel at 7.8 acres. While their first house in Buffalo had touches of opulence, the Hartford project offered a blank canvas on which to make a statement. The grand home that they built very conspicuously announced their social status and Twain's standing as a significant cultural figure. Although the name Mark Twain was and is attached to the house, the design and details of the house were overseen by his wife, Olivia. She hired the architect, Henry Tuckerman Potter, after consulting with friends, and she drafted her own floor plan for a three-story building on a foundation measuring 105 feet by 62 feet. The final product was a 19-room mansion estimated to be just under 12,000 square feet of extravagant space for their family life and frequent entertaining. It included kitchen and living quarters for as many as eight servants who executed the domestic routines and catering for social events. An adjacent two-story carriage house with a two-story L afforded an additional 1,280 square feet of living space for the coachman and his family. Now, even for prosperous Hartford, Hartford, this new house was an extravagance, with five fully plumbed bathrooms, gas lighting throughout, and central heating. It was, then, a very modern building. But the architectural aesthetics were another matter. As the house took shape, it became the talk of the town, not all of it flattering. It was often derided for its collision of design motifs. In the Hartford Press, the over-the-top home was declared, quote, one of the oddest-looking buildings in the state ever designed for a dwelling, if not in the whole country. When asked in an interview to divine, define its style, Clemens minced his words. Well, there are 19 different styles in it, and folks can take their pick. It wouldn't do to call it mongrel, for that would be offensive to some. I guess we'll call it eclectic. The word describes everything that can't be otherwise described. Now, the hubbub that the property generated prompted Twain to turn to poetry as a means of getting in on the fun and to show that he could withstand criticism. He described his house in this sestet, which was printed in a traveler's insurance company publication. 
This is the house that Mark built. These are the bricks of various hue and shape and position, straight and askew, with nook and angles and gables too, which make up the house presented to view, the curious house that Mark built. Now, rather than being stunned by criticism of wagging tongues, Twain summons his playful wit. Adapting the nursery rhyme, The House That Jack Built, he projects characteristic self-effacement in a whimsical regard for the otherwise serious business of property ownership. Begun in 1873, the house wouldn't be completed until 1875, almost a year after the family had taken up residence. And the work continued almost unabated with modifications as well as custom decorations by Louis Tiffany's Associated Artists Studio added well into the 1880s. Total value of the house and grounds are difficult to determine, and Clemens's own estimates varied widely. The 1877 tax assessment of $66,650 is one official benchmark, which in current value would be about $1.78 million today. But that figure seems low, given the custom craftsmanship and architectural appointments not to mention the furnishings that the couple collected on an extended European shopping trip at a time when the global economy teetered between two depressions. Now you might wonder why I'm, I'm emphasizing the monetary value of the property. As a luxurious residence and the setting of frequent extravagant social events, the Hartford property exerted serious financial pressure on Clemens. And once again, as Mark Twain, he looked to poetry, this time to express his frustration with the onerous financial reality of real estate ownership. These annual bills, these annual bills, how many a song their discord trills of truck consumed, enjoyed, forgot, since I was skimmed by last year's lot. Those joyous beans are passed away. Those onions blithe, oh, where are they? Once loved, lost, mourned, now vexing ills, your shades troop back in annual bills. And so twill be when I'm aground, these yearly duns will still go round, while other bards with frantic quills shall damn and damn these annual bills. Now, several aspects of this quasi-sonnet are worth noting. First, each of the three stanzas is composed of two couplets. So he seems to have figured out how to make the second line rhyme with the first. More to the point, as the financial burden of maintaining an opulent household occupies his attention, he converts these economic responsibilities into a constrained literary performance that is a study in contrasts. For example, the rollicking rhythm of iambic hexameter with dactyls in the title phrases suggests a lively waltz at odds with the fretful condition he describes. Unlike my ranch, which, which celebrates the value and utility of property, those annual bills bemoans the costs of conspicuous consumption, though in a mock deflation of their lavish lifestyle. His itemization of expenses on beans, onions, and truck projects a humble standard of living quite at variance with the menus that the Clemens dinner parties featured. Perhaps most importantly, this compressed form of writing stands in sharp contrast to the expansive manuscripts required by the subscription book publishing market through which he published his major works and which provided the financial resources for their expensive lifestyle. Instead, his worry over the escalating expenses that the Hartford household incurred <clears throat> leads him in the opposite direction, to compact verse as a vehicle for venting his frustration with overspending, as if the strain of financial obligations imposes constraints on his form of expression. Now, the closing stanza expresses fear that these recurring costs will outlive him which was a growing source of anxiety for Sam Clemens, especially later in life, as he worried about how to provide a sustainable standard of living for his heirs. But he also imagines these financial burdens 
as a literary legacy, one that other writers will take up with frantic quills, suggesting that material, care, material cares are the stuff of which poetry should be concerned, rather than the more abstract subjects and emotional reflections that are conventional in poetry. Now, although the two early poems that dealt with fictional property were parodic and unfinished, the two Hartford poems deal with aspects of actual property. In the first instance, aesthetic qualities, or as the critics of the Hartford House would say, deficits. And in the second case, the financial burdens that lavish real estate and the matching lifestyle entailed. These latter two poems exhibit no di difficulty with poetic form, and his focus is trained on the realities of owning real estate, real real estate, and not imagined it or fraudulent property. To be sure, Twain explored the perils of property ownership in prose as well. In the 1870s sketch titled Political Economy, he is so absorbed in his attempt to write a treatise on the serious intellectual topic that he is an easy target for an, un, for an unscrupulous lightning rod salesman. Consequently, Twain's Buffalo home is covered with such an excessive array of conductive material that an electrical storm turns it into a pyrotechnic display to which the 4th of July could not compete. While living in the Hartford house, he wrote the McWilliamses and the Burglar Alarm, which details the need to install a security system that would presumably mitigate the vulnerabilities of upper middle class home ownership. But as in political economy, the expense and the ineffectiveness of the system lead to ridiculously disastrous consequences. And in the $30,000 bequest, he explores what he had called the burden of prospective wealth to inflame the imagination and to crush one's spirit in disappointment. These humorous prose texts are effective accounts of the travails of property ownership. Nonetheless, the ratio of his poetic performances that address the difficulties of ownership is striking. While it's clearly risky to draw firm conclusions from such a small sample of texts, we can't ex ignore the fact that when his literary attention turned to the implications of property, he would sometimes reach for poetry, a form recognized for its economy, or as he called it in the My Ranch footnote, expressionomy. I think we can agree that there's good reason why Mark Twain is not remembered for his poetry, but I hope that I've showed that we shouldn't discount his efforts either. In these rare verse performances, he exhibits a keen understanding of how the discourses that establish property ownership are prone to the kind of ambiguity, compression, and interpretive judgment that we recognized as central to the economy of poetry. Moreover, when he settles into it, he shows both humor and an ability to make the second line rhyme with the first. Thank you.